Let me pray. Father, we long to experience your welcome. And that welcome, we hope, would be an outpour as we engage with people that we love, people we meet, every soul we encounter. Allow us to also extend that welcome in a world that needs it. We honor you, Father, as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I am JP. I, I pastor the kids, the youth, the young adults. Yes, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I, I get that a lot. Don't worry. Um, when I wed people, the event organizers would put me in the, in the entourage because he or she would say, that's the seat for the pastor. And I was like, I am the pastor. <laughs> I also am an usher. If you could remember, I, I, I stay there and uh, welcome all of you. As I try my very best to look at each and everyone's eyes and say that I've seen you and I welcome you to our community. I'm saying that because we will be talking about hospitality today. Welcome. Providing home to people. Now let me submit that if you do not remember how it feels like to be homeless, you would have a hard time being passionate in providing home to other people. Let me say that again. If you don't remember the stealing from within, the pain of being unwelcomed, unwanted, alienated, it will be hard for you to be passionate. It will be hard for you to, be, to welcome people and make it personal. Now, some of us here have experienced being displaced in a literal sense, that you really lost your shelter. But I dare say that all of you, including myself, experienced some sort of homelessness in your life. Say, for example, you were a kid and you're boisterous. You, you ask too much because you're a kid. And adults shut you up. So you feel like you're no longer comfortable with your own skin. Hey, this is relevant to me. Last Thursday, I was having dinner in a restaurant somewhere here. And I called my son, video call. And he confronted me. We, we're there now. <laughs> He's seven years old. And confronting is happening now. And he told me, Papa, whenever you shout, whenever you're angry, He said three things. I feel I'm not handsome. <laughs> Second, I feel I'm not smart. Maybe because when I shout, it makes him look like he's not smart. No, he doesn't know what he's doing. And third, I feel I'm, loved. I'm unloved. He has a shelter, but he feels homeless. Or you can be a teenager, or you were a teenager, and people force you to be someone. You know, you're still figuring out who you are. You're still trying to know even your personality. And yet, your peers, today it's social media even, parents, relatives, want you to be a certain kind of way. And that feeling is hitting you because no one understands. You have a shelter, but you don't feel at home. And then you become a young adult, or if you're a young adult right now, and you open your heart up for love, to give love, only eventually to be betrayed, left, neglected, 
rejected. Also, you invest in dreams. Go out there only for the world to crush it. Brokenhearted, dreams crushed, no one understands. You have a shelter, but you don't have a home. And then you become an adult, you have family, you contribute to a bigger picture, a bigger goal. And yet, it feels like everything is just stagnant, repeating over and over and over again. And you wonder, is there really a point? What, what if I just stop and do what I want to do? I've always wanted to do this. Does anyone even appreciate the sacrifices I did? You have a house, but you don't feel at home. And then you become a lolo, a lola, a senior citizen. You look back in your life and you ask yourself, did I really make a dent in society? You're all alone one Tuesday night. No one even bothers to call. No one even bothers to visit. You have a shelter. You have a family, but you don't feel at home. And many times in my life, I experienced the same, but there is this one instance that is the core memory right here. I was 10, and I joined the singing competition in our school. So it was after class, so you'd bring your own clothes, apparently. I should, I should bring my own clothes because no one watched me. All the other participants, all the other kids had their parents who were shouting the loudest. I go in, everyone was just polite. And I knew it. Your kids, they're very perceptive. I go in there, I know it, everyone is just polite. But I did my thing, I sang. Eventually I lost. I could have a vivid image because I knew that I did not look good because I don't know how to even style myself today. It's my wife who makes that decision. Okay. So imagine how much worse did I look that time. A 10-year-old went there on his own, went home, ate dinner like nothing happened. I lost. And from that point on, I told a lie to myself. In this life, you'd be alone. You have to do things on your own. No one's going to support you. I have a shelter. But I do not have a home. If you do not remember these pains, you will not be passionate in not letting a single individual not under your watch, to experience the same thing. And I'm not just saying this because of opinion or just a wise thought, because this is exactly what the passage is saying if you study it in context. Like our very short scripture reading a while ago, 1 Peter 4 verse 9 says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So what I did is I separated this small sentence into three points. The first point is show hospitality. The second point is show hospitality to one another. And the third point is show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So the movement of thought or logic is it builds up until we fully understand what the passage is saying. So let's begin with the first thing. Show hospitality. Literally, it's saying, be a foreigner's friend. Hospitality, literally, is foreigner's friend. Now, it comes to life if you read that in context. If you read that first from the paragraph to where it came from, in verse 7 it says, the end of all things is at hand, and one of the therefores is... Therefore, show hospitality to one another. 
So the logic is, be a foreigner's friend because these are trying times. But it even makes more sense why you want to become a foreigner's friend during the time that Peter wrote this. Because who are the recipients? Who were the recipients? If you would go to chapter 1, verse 1, the recipients were, if I may read, to those who are elect exiles. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The people who were forced to be homeless because of the persecution of Christians. So the, the idea here is that be a foreigner's friend, not be, only because these are trying times, but also because you are one. You know how hard it is. You are unwelcome where you are right now. You're a foreigner. You're an alien. And then when you zoom out your lenses to say New Testament context, you would, you would further wonder why like Jesus Christ seemed to present hospitality as a norm. Remember the parable of the midnight visitor? You can look it up. The midnight visitor talks about hospitality. A friend goes in to, to another friend's house, knocks and asks for food over and over again at night, and, and the other guy had to do it. Of course, Good Samaritan. The hospitality came even outside from a foreigner, ironically. So, but you see, the hospitality is very central. Where, where is the New Testament coming from? Where, is, where was Peter coming from? Where was... Everyone here coming from, very simple. They're coming from the law. Because it was a law to be hospitable. If I may read the law itself. Leviticus 19, 32 to 34. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. Not only that, you shall treat the stranger sojourns with you as the native among you, like he belongs, like his family. And not only that, you shall love him as yourself. Why? Why? For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know what it feels like to be lost. Therefore, let it not happen to a single soul after this, you for one should understand. All I'm saying is hospitality is personal. Since you've been alienated before, since you know how it feels, you'd never want to let it happen again. Not on your watch. But hospitality is not only personal. Hospitality must also be impartial. What do I mean? You can't just be hospitable, or maybe here in church, or maybe in your family, to one person, or to people like you, or people you like. Because if you choose one, you automatically not choose another. And therefore, you are becoming inhospitable to a certain son, a certain child, a certain daughter, a certain relative, or a certain churchmate, certain ministry team member, a certain office mate, I don't know. To be truly hospitable is to be hospitable without partiality, without favoritism. And that's where we go to the second point. Peter says, show hospitality to not just to your friends, not just to people you like, nor to people like you. Show hospitality to one another. Because it's easy to be hospitable to people who you like and you love. But the ch church then, and the people of God ever since, they were urged to become impartial in treating all. And to give a testimony about how we as a church, GCF, how we have been hospitable. I'd like to welcome to the stage... Good friend of mine, almost like a son, sometimes a brother. It depends on which day. <laughs> it's part of my growth group. Let's all welcome Coco.
Uh, hello, Church. My name is Coco. Uh, I grew up with an intellectual disorder. And through the years, I often told myself that I don't have the ability to be like my friends or natural leaders or willing volunteers, just like the ushering team in youth life. I know that volunteering in church was going to be a huge step for me, and it would be hard for me to take on that responsibility, given my condition. But despite my fears and hesitations, I was welcomed with people with open arms, and I felt like I found a place to belong in the youth life community. Here, I was able to socialize with other people and meet friends, especially with, within my age range. It was not easy at first since I was an introvert. I thought that people would make, make me feel like I was different just because of my condition. But through time, I was able to share more about myself and my experiences in life, and I had the opportunity to know, to know more about the Word of God. The youth love community welcomed me and showed me God's love uh, through their words and action. Eventually, I was able to join in high school camps and found myself very comfortable with other youth. When I'd see my fellow campers in church, I'd ask them how their day or week was and if anything fun or memorable happened. It has also become a habit to ask them for their prayer requests and praise items. By God's grace alone, I could say that He, he has enabled me to push past my own limitations. I started serving as, a, as an usher in youth life back in 2019, and now I serve as a frontline leader in University Belt. I, I am also a youth group, a Y group leader, and a youth small group leader from my aunt's growth group that, that branched out. So if you know someone or you yourself wants to be a part of a community to belong to, don't hesitate to reach out to any pastor or usher here today. And to my fellow GCFers, I encourage you to live a life that welcomes people. Because being hospitable to someone is one of the things that we can do to show God's love through words and actions. I was in this situation before, and I know the feeling of being alone and not wanted. But because people here in church were approachable, I felt welcome and accepted because of how approachable the people here in the church are. And how they listen to my day or week to the point that I want to, to do the same thing and did for others. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, first time I met Coco, he was my roommate in camp 2015. And speaking of camp, we again have camps this year. So the dates will be flashed, save the date. And also, if you know people who you feel or you would allow us to welcome, just like how we allowed or how we welcome Coco, not just to be with us, but also eventually to lead with us and partner with us with the kingdom's cause. Haba. <laughs> you can please save these dates and forward it to people, your, your sons, daughters, your cousins, your friends. Going back, going back. Hospitality should be impartial. There must be no disqualifying factor regardless of any kind of disability. I remember Acts chapter 6. It was where, well, Peter was part of what's going on. In Acts chapter 6, what happened was the widows of the Hellenistic, the Hellenistic widows felt like they weren't treated fairly or equally like how the Jewish widows were treated. So if you think about it, widows shouldn't be even provided for in the law of their time. But the church, they were doing it. So they were becoming hospitable. But also the issue was partiality that the hospitality must be equal for all. And in the same church, and I mean, in Jerusalem, when James was pastoring it, the brother of Christ, one of the major issues was they were partially or being treat, or treating prop better, I meant, people with more money. Why? Because the church was struggling. 
there was a famine. And to that, James said, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This means there must be no discrimination. Everyone must be welcome regardless of social strata. No rich, no poor, no helper, no amo. Whatever age, no matter how young and noisy, old and just as noisy, piercings, tattoos, musical preferences, no matter how different you are, no boss, no employee. In here, brothers, sisters, ates, kuyas, uncles, aunts, moms, dads, lolos, and lolas. Family. That is hospitality. This means there's no discrimination with, against people with any kind of disability. Let it be mental or psychiatric. They should have a place to call home, grow, heal, be connected to a professional, which we have in ERCC. Just approach us, anyone from the pastors or the staff here. We would love to connect you to that ministry. And, not, and then after that, be given opportunities to grow and be given opportunities eventually to serve just like Oho. And even physical disabilities. I, I praise God when, when you attend our Tagalog services, we have a growing deaf and mute community. But they're not just welcome. They're even welcome to partner with us with the Great Commission's cause. To lead, to grow. There must be no racism. Everyone must be welcome in your family or when your family gets bigger, meaning the color of one's skin must not be a deterrent. Ethnicity even must never be a deterrent. And I'd like to zoom out and think about more a societal sense. There must be hospitality to refugees. People are running away because of persecution in their governments, especially your brothers and sisters in the faith. If you have one way or the other, a connection, some sort that allows you to make that possible for our country, do so because that's central to you becoming a Christian or you being a Christian. But at least we also speak against it. People don't know where to lie their head. Children, we can do something about it, church. Do all these and do it because you want to, not just because you have to. That's a major qualifying factor because that's point three. That's how Peter ended this statement. Show hospitality, be a foreigner's friend to one another without grumbling without murmuring, without complaining. It's as if you really want it. It's not out of duty. This is really what you want to do. And you want to do that because you were unwelcome before. And I dare say that it's impossible to truly be hospitable if you don't want to do it. Because it's either it's written all over your face or you're, you're good in pretending, which is not very truthful. So when you do hospitality in church or in your family, mean it. Like when you talk to an individual, really listen, not just be a, because this is a formality thing, because we're in church, I just have to you know, go through the motions. People see through that. You see through that. By the way, grumbling for the Jews was a big emotive word. It, it reminds them of what happened when, they, when their ancestors were in the desert for four years. They grumbled a lot about food, about, about water, about Moses' leadership, about God's direction. And, well, God wasn't pleased and gave them so many consequences. Welcome one another without grumbling. You see, grumbling roots from a forgetfulness that leads to ungratefulness. You, you forget. 
You forget the goodness of God in your life. You forget that you were once alienated. You forget that you were once in the position of that person. So you don't get passionate in making sure that that person doesn't feel the same thing that you experienced before. How do we apply this? Maybe, maybe first we go beyond just entertaining. What do I mean? Entertaining means go to my house, go to our church. This is what we have. It's nice. We go beyond that and say, go to our house, go to this church, be at home. This is yours. And we want to grow with you here. Maybe we have to also contact people who felt alienated in our growth groups, in our gatherings, in our ministries. Often they would just leave without saying anything. And you have to see that as a cue. What went on? What if a phone call after the service could suffice? Or maybe meet, have coffee. What went on? How do you want to make a person feel at home again? What are some of the things that you and I should be repenting of? What practices have we been doing that subtly discriminate others? Or how are we creating cliques? How do we separate ourselves from others? And we draw lines. You just are there and we are just here. Did you and I let social status, disabilities, appearance dictate who we welcome, who we talk to? What's your version of repentance towards becoming hospitable? I just want to say, just like what Coco said, if you are one of those people who are shy because you know you're going through something or you're not like the rest, we'd love to welcome you and help you and partner with you in figuring out God's call in your life. But you see, as we go to the conclusion, welcoming, at one part, it's because you were unwelcomed. But in another part, this other side of the coin, it's because you have been graciously welcomed too. Did you see that? You are not just welcoming people because you know what it feels like when you were unwelcomed. You are also welcoming people because you received a kind of welcome that no other person can give. And that kind of welcome is so overwhelming that you naturally pour out hospitality and love to others in uncontrollably. For all of you, you know that the unwelcoming that happened in your life, the, the, one, the thing that made you feel homeless, you know it's no longer true, right? Because of Jesus Christ, because of his community of faith, that when you stop and pause and look at your life right now, there really are people that God sent. Whenever I feel rejected today, Whenever I'm triggered, something happens. I, I become a kid again. I become a 10-year-old in the midst of strangers, singing, because, and everyone would be affirming because they have to be polite again in my head. I can tell myself right now that this is no longer true. That I am forever welcome home. That I am never truly alone. You are never truly alone. I remember the pain, yes, because I never want to let another person experience that. But I also remember that time when all these feelings ended. It was a simple decision. A kuya in church approached me. 
opened a little track, a yellow one, and said, all I gotta do is accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and that's it. Didn't change immediately, but it became a process of discipleship with that kuya and another kuya and another kuya, and slowly but surely I understood. And, you know, th- this is why I, together with the, all the others, and together with all the pastors, that's why we usher. And if you notice, when we, when we usher, when I usher, I try to really look in your eye and I try to really say hi to the point that my face is cramping every dinner time on a Sunday. And it's not because I'm forcing myself. It's because I know what it feels like to go in and out of place and no one notices. It's like, did, did I really just go somewhere? I know what it feels like. But more than that, because it's uncontrollable. This passion, this joy of welcoming people is uncontrollable because I know how welcome I am in Jesus Christ. There is no one who epitomizes hospitality more than Jesus. Why? Because no one forced God to send him. And he did that even while we were yet sinners. We were really supposed to be unwelcomed. And yet, grace, mercy, we are welcomed still. Remember the prodigal son? In a parable Jesus shared, a son demanded, demanded his inheritance, squandered it, then eventually confesses to his father that he has sinned against him and is no longer worthy of being called his son. But when he went home, the father orders his servant to bring him the best robe, ring, and shoes and, and prepare a feast. The son, the sinner, he wasn't just welcomed home. He was celebrated. You're not just welcome. You're celebrated. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. We have people coming and going. And in this parable, there's also another person, the older brother who hated it that the other one went home. Let's not be that older brother. Let's not forget how welcomed, how we have always been in the presence of God. You know, every morning when you wake up, if you're the coffee type, then after coffee, (laughs) preach the gospel to yourself. You don't have to force yourself in the heart of God anymore. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you wake up and tell it to yourself, I am already accepted. I am not going to do anything today just to get the, 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 to be pleased, to please men, to please other people. I am already accepted in God and what I'm going to do today is worship Him with whatever comes my way with my work, with my relationships. It's no longer about finding my spot. It's no longer about earning my way through, through whatever field I am in. It starts to become a journey of gratitude. Thank you, Lord, because I'm accepted. I'm just going to pour out this love to other people, this excellence because of worship. But what on earth is the gospel anyway? I mean, maybe you've been attending here for for quite some time or you're just, you attended here for the first time a while ago, we welcomed you. Or maybe you did not stand up because you're trying to be subtle as well. But but you might be thinking, so much jargon, what's the gospel? What's that that I will preach to myself every morning? The gospel is simple. We have a sin problem. We do wrong things from Adam and Eve until today. We have the propensity to sin and we live with the consequences of that sin. Broken relationships plague us, lost opportunities, consequences on many things. And we need a savior. 
Romans 6, 23 said, for the wages of sin is death. And here's the gospel. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And if you think about it, with our flaws, with our faults, why would a perfect God want us? What can we contribute to his perfection? Absolutely nothing, and that's exactly the good news. We are the ones who need him. We need saving. We keep on doing wrong things. We have this habit of doing wrong things, and we continue to face the consequences of the wrongs we do every waking day of our lives, and we need a savior. Lord, save me. And that's the point why Jesus came. To save us from ourselves. From the consequences of the wrongs we did. And if you receive him. To all who did receive him. Who believe in his name. He gave the right. To become children of God. You have the right to say, I am a son, I am a daughter, and I am forever welcomed home. That's what you preach yourself to yourself day by day. And if you haven't made that decision yet, to say, Lord, surrender my life, I've done wrong things, and I'm living in regret or many other consequences of those said wrong things. I want an end. I want a new journey. I accept your son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. All you gotta do is believe in the deepest part of your heart. Say, Jesus Christ, you are now my king, not myself, not other people. You. I don't know how to change. That's why I need a savior. I don't want to do this anymore. Come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be. And it doesn't have to be even that words or those words. It should just be the authentic you saying it. I'll be pausing. If you're a person who made that decision before, then preach it to yourself again. You don't have to force yourself into the heart of God. And you don't have to earn your way into this world to be significant already because you're already a son and daughter of God. Change the narrative When you do your jobs, when you do your relationship, when you welcome people, it's because you're just filled with love. And if you haven't made that decision yet, take this pause as well to come to Jesus Christ, to come to the altar, because our Father's arms are open wide.